Hi everyone, welcome to Building Pro Social Games, Designing Inclusive Social Experiences. What exactly is pro-social behavior? They are social acts that benefit other people or society as a whole, such as helping, sharing, donating, cooperating, and volunteering. How does that cross over into video games? If you're watching this, there's high likelihood that you're part of crafting player experiences through games. In a study called Video Games for Pro-Social Learning in 2019, Gene Koo and Scott Sider found that video games have the capacity to deepen moral reasoning, open players to new perspectives, shape or reinforce positive behaviors, and provide a field for practicing cooperation. It goes to show that social design in games goes beyond having a few features to play multiplayer together. Play at its core is social. It teaches us how to get along with others. Games can bring us together, but first they have to be welcoming. Let's take a look at the impact of disruptive players on a game. In a survey of about 2,000 plus individuals on what inclusion means to players by Jenny Shi in 2019, Toxicity comes in as the second highest cause of concern for players about the industry, after game quality. Toxicity is more harmful than things like brand fatigue, originality, and monetization practices. As impactful as games can be, people are being driven away because of the potential harm they could encounter from interacting with other players. Who am I and why are we talking about this topic? I'm May, a game designer, and I'm passionate about social design and inclusive games. I've previously worked at places like Ubisoft, EA, and Warner Brothers. I've worked on different multiplayer and social features in games where the protagonists wear masks, very timely in this pandemic, uh, and games like Ghost Recon Phantoms, Watch Dogs 2, Star Wars Battlefront 2, and Hyperscape. And this is what sparked and sustained my interest in this domain. Like so many of us who play games to stay in touch with friends and loved ones, I hope we can do better in building pro-social gaming experiences. Building better experiences is an intentional process. You may have heard of this quote made famous by Joe Jeshant, a renowned speaker on inclusion. If you do not intentionally, deliberately, and proactively include, you will unintentionally exclude. This section will hopefully help us rethink who gets left behind or isolated in the experiences we build and how we bring them back into the fold. In terms of game design, creating equitable gameplay systems brings us one step closer to building pro-social experiences. The first goal is to build cohesion between players. We can do this if we create roles that promote a variety of contribution. A role is defined as a strategic approach to play. Um, think tanks, damage dealers, supports, and a class is best thought of as a fixed loadout or a bucket of player abilities. A cleric or a paladin are classes, but either one may take on the role of a healer. The more roles a game is able to support, the more gameplay styles open up to players. Players can employ different strategy and tactics to outsmart and outdo one another. Are the exchanges between these players zero-sum or positive-sum or mutually beneficial? Is the player required to make a sacrifice to help? A medical pack versus an area of effect heal work very differently. One requires sacrifice while the other is mutually beneficial, making the decision a lot easier. Can the player's action add to their social capital, hence increasing their value and worth amongst other players in the game? Next, do players get to opt in or are the actions required of them mandatory to perform. Will they be punished for not participating? The diagram on the lower right is taken from a paper named The Trust Spectrum by Raf Koster and Aaron Camerata. It shows that if players' abilities overlap one another, meaning that they can do what the other player can also do, very little trust is needed and the player participation is optional. In high trust scenario, on the other hand, there's almost no overlap in player abilities. Each player is unique in what they can do, making their participation absolutely necessary. Not playing their role leads to conflict and frustration. And by building in levers that encourage generosity and reciprocity, we allow for the recipient of a gesture to return in kind, forming a loop where connections can happen. Another method to build equitable gameplay systems is by widening the funnel for success. 
When we are able to do this, we open gameplay up to more players to participate. If the game pits players or teams against another, allowing multiple strategies that lead to success helps shift the focus from speed, precision, and reflexes to one based on strategy. This means that each team member can contribute in different ways. An example from Splatoon, in the Turf War game mode, the, game, the team's goal is to paint as much of the map as possible within a given time. Players who are not proficient at shooting can meaningfully contribute to their team by using a wide roll of brush to paint as much of the surface area as possible to reach that goal. We also have to ask ourselves, what behaviors do the game systems consistently reward or highlight? If it's a shooter, does it only glorify and reward top killers and headshots that are made? Players will take the path of least resistance regardless of what our intentions are. For the players to feel included, consider rewarding and acknowledgement systems that also celebrate different gameplay styles and altruistic contributions. The second part to creating pro-social gameplay systems is to foster psychological safety in the game. Let's take a short detour by looking at this concept of the Dunbar's number. Psychologist Robin Dunbar posits that there is a limit to the number of people with whom we can maintain stable social relationships, and that number is 150. The people we are closest to and trust the most begin at the center of these concentric circles. They are who we trust most with our secrets and will turn to in times of distress. And as we move towards the outer circles, the trust level starts to fall off. People in the outermost circles are the ones we know but are not as close with. The level of trust we have in a relationship influences our interactions with one another. Now consider absolute strangers who sit outside of these circles. Those weak, non-existent social ties are starved of trust. As designers, it is important to understand the impact of game systems we build through the lens of these trust levels or lack thereof. In order to create psychological safety, we need to reduce or distribute the pain of loss. When there is lack of trust, lessening the pressure on total strangers to be 100% coordinated to win helps. It leaves room for trial and error, it's less harmful when someone messes up, which is want to happen, especially when they're new to the game. The second point to reducing exclusivity or gatekeeping um, is that it's an important part to, to equally celebrate player mastery, but while doing so, we have to ask ourselves if the same system could end up punishing or excluding other players. Can one person be targeted for the loss of an entire match? This painfully highlights and puts pressures on players who are new or just less proficient at the game as a whole. As much as possible, prevent unhealthy side-by-side -side comparisons. Here's an example. If the game only shows the kill-death ratios of players in a match, then those who take on support or healer roles will be heavily punished because of their contributions, because those contributions cannot be measured by those same stats. When there is no psychological safety, players become risk-averse and fear failure. Players should not fear being put down and punished by their own team members at the very least. Another aspect of creating so psychological safety is to reduce interpersonal risk. The case for voice chat is that it is an indis indispensable tool to help players bond. However, it should not be a crutch for gameplay or design. Voice chat is context-rich. It exposes information about the user, such as their gender, race, or age. And these, these are details that are also the same ones that put them at risk of harassment. Reliance on voice chat also presupposes that both parties can speak the same language to begin with. This puts non-users at a heavy disadvantage, especially in competitive games, because they are a tool that they are shut out of using. Consider the relationship as well between users of voice chat. How strangers communicate is very different versus close friends. There are so many layers where miscommunications can occur. To make a case for this, Ewok is a 14-year-old pro Fortnite player who's deaf and she relies heavily on sound visualization to succeed in her matches. It's never easy for her to communicate when playing with teammates. She has to type her chat on the second monitor and during those times, someone could easily shoot at her. When designing communication tools, the broad questions we have to ask ourselves are what, which refers to the type of on-task information that needs conveying, where, defining the content and space where that information needs to be made available, and when, can the information, when shared, get lost amongst other active feedback. 
Some games are gradually making headway in this space. Apex Legends team, for example, have taken the principle of building the ping system with accessibility in mind and seeing the tool's usage extend beyond the primary audience that it was built for. Another method to encourage pro-social behavior in games is to set up an environment of positivity. Having positive fictional identities can create an overall environment that is less toxic. This encompasses content we create, like emotes, NPCs, emblems, etc. Researchers Niki and James Jeremy Valentin discovered a phenomenon they labeled the Proteus effect, in which the behavior of an individual within virtual walls is changed by the characteristics of the avatar. In other words, we roleplay or slip into the shoes of the characters of the game universe we are in. So if they are positive, we unconsciously reflect that too. We also need to predict the potential for abuse or manipulation that our content could encounter. For example, turning on or off collision in a social space is a simple, easy design choice to make, but it makes all the difference in players being able to abuse those emotes to block access to doorways or vendors, or using interruptible emotes to create offensive gestures. Does the cost of keeping them in the game outweigh the potential disruptive behavior that could arise? A well-crafted code of conduct can also help to create psychological safety in the community of the game. They are user-facing and communicates the game's shared social norms. They define how relationships work between one player to another, to other groups, and to institutions. Code of conducts should be aspirational. Designers have to work with community developers to define the values that their ideal community should embody. What does belongingness look like in your game? Secondly, code of conduct should be accessible. That means the guidelines are easy to easily understood, they're clearly defined, easily discoverable in and outside of the game, and the rules are deemed fair and justice applies to all players. Having an immersive code of conduct that's embedded in the game's lore helps keep players engaged and it ties back to the Proteus effect mentioned earlier. Players are able to embody the character in the game universe they're in. A great and entertaining example of this is the Pirate's Code, Sea of Thieves' code of conduct for their community. Once we've built out all those design features, the second, equally as important part of encouraging pro-social behavior is tied to the enforcement of those positive social norms. Let's take a look at what that means. Prevention features require close collaboration between social design and UX teams to build out features that, first of all, let players set social safety boundaries by giving them um, privacy management tools, as well as defining social preference settings that are respectful. Building features that enforce um, positive social values as stipulated in the Code of Conduct also helps um, enforce those and remind players of those positive social values. Endorsement systems are a good way to help keep those values in the player's mind and what those positive social norms are, making them a great rehabilitation tools for reoffending players as well. There is a disclaimer though, there's always a danger when motivating players extrinsically as this encourages them to gain the system. The detection of disruptive anti-social behavior can be split into two general approaches. One, Automated detection systems take the load off of human moderators and are increasingly precise in their capabilities of detecting offenses. Machine learning aided chat filters, um, identifying idle or away from keyboard players, and anti-cheat solutions are absolutely necessary to help developers identify offenders as early as possible. To catch offenders who fall through the gaps, giving community reporting or counter abuse tools is a form of crowdsourcing the community health. Good reporting systems should define the anti-patterns of an offense as well to reduce the abuse of the system to begin with. Centralized systems allow the live services team and community managers to build a full picture of a player across the various touch points of a game by tracking them across the game's ecosystems while they are playing or while they are outside engaging in forums or websites. This is done by bringing together the player account, the reports and the logs 
where they can be accessed by community developers, customer support, or the live services team. The benefits of having a platform level access means that developers can choose if a player's experience can be impacted across other game titles too. So if a player is toxic in one game, they might not be able to access another. The goal of having a good deterrence system is to encourage offenses and disincentivize recidivism. Effective sanctions are ones that apply context-specific penalties that tie in with the offense to begin with. Some examples of this. If an offender was toxic in text or voice chat, revoking their communication channels helped them cool it off. Disabling a cheater's progression is more effective than banning their account, especially if it takes seconds for them to create a brand new one and surface other problems like smurfing. Messaging systems that deliver a clear lesson can help players learn to habilitate. To the offender, swift, consistent, and clear reasoning will help them understand where they went wrong. For players who did the reporting to begin with, sending follow-up messages if an offender is reprimanded is crucial in helping instill trust that the reporting system works. The rule of thumb here with these systems is to be able to differentiate between occasional offenders and chronically toxic or disruptive players. Building and implementing these tools and features take time and high cro and it requires high cross-functional dependencies, so they need to be done as early as possible in development. It's important for developers, community managers, customer service teams, and marketing to come together to build each piece that's required in this huge puzzle. When done right, mitigation systems will help prevent the occurrence and reduce the frequency and impact of disruptive behavior. A centralized profile management system helps build a full picture of each player's profile based on their actions, and a deterrent system will help deliver appropriate intervention and discourage re-offenders through rehabilitation. As developers, what are we building towards? More inclusive games that enable players to feel psychologically safe while playing, find a sense of meaning and belonging in its community, and access its universal benefits. The surge of popularity in games like Animal Crossing, New Leaf, and Among Us in this pandemic shows how much we want to connect with each other, and therefore these experiences need to be built right. In conclusion, toxicity and disruptive behavior do not happen in a vacuum. It stems from a culmination of various affordances that signal to the player how they should treat others in the game. I hope this presentation has inspired you that we can build positive bonding experiences in our game when we deliberately design to include. Thank you.